Right. So today's training is about basically how to get out of the crap if you're in it. And you've got three experts today here. Two of them, uh, Russ and myself, on how to cock up a company, how to uh, make the tough changes, come out the other side leaner, but battle scarred and uh, smarter and wiser and being able to make those tougher decisions to be able to run your business leaner uh, to the point and also make sure that you are got the right indicators in advance and you're able to make those decisions based on data and on numbers and visibility of the right numbers so that you can run your business uh, profitably, predictably and give you a lot more confidence and clarity to make the right decisions. We've also got Mr. Liam Walker back today from BDO. Hey team. Hey mate, how are you going? To give good, us good. give us some good uh, financial insights uh, into exactly uh, where and how to look at those numbers and make those cuts. All right, so you should all have a workbook. Can you give me a hell yeah if you have a workbook here? Type in hell yeah if you've got a workbook. Because we're going to work through this and we're actually going to give you some action points to do. So when I was racing motorbikes, there was a great thing that um, – there's only two types of motorcyclists, those who've crashed and that those who are going to crash. And I'd also put business owners and building company owners particularly in this uh, two categories as well. Those who've had major financial challenges and gone through them or those who are about to experience those and go through them. So what we got, I've yet to meet a successful building company owner over the thousands that we've met over the last 15 years and gone through our program who've yet to uh, experience this in some form or capacity. And today what we want to do is we want to shine a light on what are the main reasons why building company owners get into the crap financially and give you a step-by-step -step plan to A, be able to diagnose it, B, forecast it in advance and give you a strategy to assess exactly where are you at now business-wise, what job should you focus on getting money in, how do you negotiate with your creditors, how do you prioritise which creditors to pay first, what you can do to free up some liquidity to give you some uh, headspace and uh, financial cash flow space, and then how to sell and market your way out of it over the next 90 days. And then lastly, what you can do strategy-wise to identify is it a cash flow problem? Is it a sales problem? Is it a marketing problem? Is it a controlling the jobs on the way through problem? Where exactly is that problem? And give you specific strategies to work on and action over the next 90 days so that you kill these problems, nip them in the bud, and don't have those as ongoing business challenges. All right, can I get a hell yeah? Hell yeah. Oh yeah. All right, so we're gonna go reasonably quick today because we've got lots to go through. Uh, so let's crack into it. All right, so I've got myself, so been in business now for close to 30 years, uh, 15 years, coaching building company owners how to scale their businesses uh, with the professional builders. And one of the main reasons that um, I'm doing this is because I've found myself in the crap before previously. We had a cleaning company uh, we scaled to the largest private cleaning company in Auckland. We had about 45 staff uh, called Life Made Easy. And consequently, we had uh, low gross margin, around 22%. We had the wrong business model. We were running employees. And I found our, our overhead started to get out of control. So we were doing about 150, 200K per month, but we only had a gross margin of around 22%. So when our overheads were around the 50K and we had revenue of 150 to 80, uh, 180 to 200 per month, then we were below covering our overheads. And I kept telling myself all these stories that it'll get better, we're investing in growth, and I didn't make the tough decisions on cutting the non-performing salespeople, changing our business model, and we'll give you some tips on what you can look at changing your business model. So consequently, I got deeper and deeper into the red and into the crap. And then I had to ended up having to borrow money from my old man, mortgaged his house to help give me an extra 50K to help uh, float this. And so what came out of this was, I came out of this with just over $300,000 uh, in personal guarantees and debt owed to the bank, the IRD, et cetera. And 
then had to go through the very stressful um, situation of liquidating that business. And consequently, it was left with me holding all the debt, despite having two other business partners. So then repaid that over the last three and a half years. So this was five years ago. And then the last 18 months, I'm able to make decisions far more strategically, clearer in advance by knowing my numbers and knowing that, hey, ultimately, whilst I want to be a good, good guy, a nice guy, it's up to me, my business, my family, on me making the right decisions. And I make these decisions purely now based off the numbers to help the business going forward and to make sure that I'm doing everything uh, in the right headspace. So what we want to do today is uh, give you a framework so that you don't have to go through this pain. You can have these numbers in advance and you can uh, see this, uh, what steps you should go through. Russ, give us a little bit about your background and your situation. That's a nice photo there of me, Marty. That's before I, that's when I had a, had a haircut because I've, I've been bloody dying for a haircut. It's been like <laughs> almost two months oh, there. <laughs> so my situation's a little bit different from Marty's, um, as in I still did my job well, part of my job. So I sold shares in my company to someone that ran it as a CEO. So all of a sudden I took my eye off the, I suppose, the helicopter view of the company and just relied on somebody else to do their job well. And at the end of the day, if, if those parts of your business are just a job for them and not their livelihood, not their whole, um, you know, not their everything, um, they just do it to the best of their ability, but there's no accountability. So I took my, my, I went and did my bit, which was sales. I did sales really well and looked after my bit. So I sort of had my head in the sand a bit um, to when all the other things fell apart. Um, sure, I was, I was to blame at the end of the day because I held all the, the personal guarantees. I had all the debt, so I ended up... Um, you know, falling over, going bankrupt personally. So I lost my cars, my houses, my boats, all that stuff, based on my trust, I suppose, on somebody else without making the other person accountable, just trusting that, you know, they were going to do their job well. But at the end of the day, um, it was still still my, you know, it's still my responsibility because I'm the one that suffer. And it's like your workers and your, your business, you know, you, that you can do really well, but hey, they might lose the job, but that's all they can, they lose. They lose a the job if it goes pear-shaped. We lose our whole... Sometimes a whole, yeah, everything, you know. So, yeah, slightly different from Marty, but um, same sort of stress, probably a little bit more stress when you go bankrupt and you lose your houses and your business and all your gear, of course. Um, but, yeah, turned it around now. So, educated myself, doing a lot of learning, educated myself um, every day I'm learning. Um, Liam spoke last week and really interested in his talk last week and, and already I've in, implemented some changes from what I learned last week. So, hey, I might be might be old and grey, but you're learning every day. And if you don't implement those things in your business right now and right right now, then you're, you're, you're mad. 100%. Thanks, me, Marty. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. And, and Liam, what do you see around uh, members that get into trouble or building company owners that have challenges that, um, you know, the common things? Or yeah, hey, business guys. owners in general? Yeah, hey, your team. Uh, Marty, it's another great photo you've found of me there, um, out and about exploring that great country of ours. Look forward to getting back to that. Um, but what both yourself and Russell spoke about are common situations. I mean, yeah, usually it's the lack of margin, uh, not being able to cover all those overheads, um, that break-even analysis um, not being done. Um, so quite commonly, we'll get companies that will be growing too fast for their own good. Um, there is such a thing, despite people not wanting to believe it. Uh, Under-resourced, that cash isn't flowing through the door, so that growth actually ends up killing them. Um, so just a bit of background about myself, if you weren't on the call last week, I am a senior manager in our business advisory services team on Auckland's North Shore. I've been with BDO now for around 13 years. Um, really enjoy partnering with small businesses along their journey and um, helping them grow, um, take care of everything along the lines of co compliance, um, really like getting some good systems in place for small businesses so business owners can spend more time on their business rather than in it. Um, so my real focus is partnering with small business owners along that journey to help them grow, give them some of those tips and tools um, to try and avoid that bankruptcy situation. But yeah, quite common what both yourself and Russ spoke about in terms of um, yeah, growing too quickly, not having that margin there to actually cover those overheads and simply not having the cash flow. Perfect. So what the first thing to do is if you do find yourself in the crap and it's a matter of 
uh, when, not if, because it happens even when you're in fast growth mode, growth consumes cash. You gotta pay for materials, you gotta pay your guys, etc. So then even then, the structuring of your deposits, your contracts, your milestones, your payment terms, becomes even more important and the more jobs you have going, if you've got any of those jobs that are bigger jobs that are either not performing well or at a low margin, the more at risk you are. So the first key thing is to identify the reason. Typically it's not one event, but it's lots of small things that happen over time. Business is a numbers of that game. So whether it's your pricing process, you're not taking everything into account in terms of PNG or getting a suitable margin. Your labor control on the way in and out. Margin going in, so there's three key areas to look at going into a job. So marketing, do you have enough leads in your pipeline so you booked out six to 12 months in advance and you've got jobs at 20% GP and you're able to pick and choose which jobs you wanna take instead of having to take a job at low margin just to keep your guys busy. Is it sales process so you're not positioning yourself as the surgeon in your particular niche and you're competing on price? Or perhaps it's your pricing process and you're not including enough into everything regarding your P&G overhead recovery margin that you need to be doing to make sure you're hitting the right margin. Next is that it, maybe it's you're getting a good margin going into the job, but a crap margin coming out. So what is it that you need to be doing coming out of the job and controlling the job on the way through? In particular, labor. The biggest thing that we see, biggest mistake most building company owners make is not controlling that forecast versus actual in terms of labor hours. So you're getting labor overruns, you're not controlling them in your toolbox meetings, you're not controlling them in your construction meetings, and not feeding back to the team, hey, we had a thousand hours for this, framing's meant to be 100 hours, we're sitting at 65 hours, but we're only halfway through. What are we gonna to do to pull back 20 hours so that we're on top of our margin? Do you have a good data management system in place? Uh, so I guess we've made a list of this. This is in the back of the uh, book, and we've got it here. These are what I see as the uh, the biggest challenges that we see and why people uh, have challenges. So lack of financial transparency. Do you know your numbers? So not just you're on a particular job. Where that's at, you need to know that. You also need to know your KPIs. So how many leads are you getting? What's your conversion rate? What's your average dollar sale? What's your margin? You need to know your company profit and loss and the profit and loss per job. So you know, hey, we might be, we've got four jobs running, margin might be at 20%, but you might have three jobs that are running at 22% and one that's running at 14%. So the one that's running at 14, we wanna dig into and find out each week, why is that job underperforming? Number two, visibility. So do you know and show your numbers? So do you have a foreman's meeting each week where each foreman has to bring how well their job is performing and how well they're going through it? Uh, do, does that feed into your construction meeting where you're identifying problems, uh, building problems, challenges, et cetera, and how they're impacting on productivity? Do you know the drivers? So you should have one KPI at least per role, one number, and you should have three KPAs. What are the key driving actions or tasks that you do each week? Not driving or not pricing to a target margin of 20% GP. That's one of the biggest uh, opportunities for your business. And typically that means getting better at marketing, getting better at sales, and making sure that you have all of those elements dressed into your um, pricing to get there. Uh, lack of marketing. So if you don't have an abundance of leads, then you're probably gonna have to take a job at a low margin just to keep you guys busy. And that's the worst situation to be in because you're gonna be competing on price. But if you have plenty of leads coming in, you're positioned as the go-to company, you can pick and choose which kind of jobs you wanna take, then you're well set up and you don't have to fall down and drop your pants on price just to get a job uh, to keep you guys busy. What would you add in uh, Russ as I'm going through here? Yeah, exactly that, Marty. One of the things is I meet a lot of builders that don't, they don't improve their sales techniques. You know, sales is a big thing as well. You can do all the marketing and all that and get the lead and get to the person's house, but then we become, you know, turn up in scruffy clothes, we're not professional, you know, the whole way, everything's gotta be professional. And also how you speak to people, how you, you know, so a lot of people probably could do a bit more work on their actual own sales. I mean, we know the building, we know the price, we know all that, but then we fall out when we actually have the sales side of it, actually when you're, when you're meeting with your client, how, how do you meet with your client? 
Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And that a big thing is sales positioning. So, are you positioned as the surgeon within your niche? What is your actual niche? Like Russ has got a niche of Villa Renos, where there's a higher labour comp- component and obviously a higher gross margin potentially in those. And if you double down into it, might be two story old villas, high end Renos, 500k to 800k or 200k to 500k. Then you're in that niche. Your team gets skilled at that. You get plenty of video testimonials and testimonials. And you can really dial down on becoming the go-to guy for that niche. Uh, lack of financial literacy, like knowing you break even your cash flow. Liam, what, what do you see here, mate? Yeah, I mean, that's a common issue. It's um, a lot of small businesses don't factor in all those overheads and that break even point. So 20% margin is great, but depending on your sales pipeline, is that 20% margin going to cover all of your overhead? So I'm talking any admin staff, your accounting fees, motor vehicle expenses, um, quite a common one as well with small businesses is the owner doesn't factor in a market salary for themselves. If you can't even get yourself a market salary, you need to start questioning, is there the potential in the long run or should I just simply go back on the tools working for someone else? So when you are looking at break-even points, make sure you're factoring in an actual market salary for yourself as a bare minimum um, because you want to make sure you are at least making enough to cover paying yourself a market wage. Or C, from Liam's perspective... Am I going, other people can do it. Am I willing to put the time in to learn the sales, the marketing, the pricing and controlling the job on the way through yep. so that I can hit that desired margin? Yeah, definitely. And like, and like Russ mentioned with those um, higher margins on the renovation, renovation of the villas, having the actual data behind there to actually be able to look at your sales, your jobs and go, okay, what potential sales for me are more profitable than others? Can I start focusing more on villa renovations? Um, uh, small minor renovations or new builds actually not producing the margins I want. So being able to have that data in behind there, so whether it's a zero or your accounting system, your job costing system, to actually look back and start looking at your sales mix and pick what kinds of jobs are more profitable for you and start targeting that with your marketing. Yep. And you yeah, never... Exactly, Marty. So, because and the other thing where we, we, a lot of us builders get sucked into, hey, we've, we've just got a $300,000 job, a $500,000 <coughs> job, a million dollar job. Mm. That doesn't mean you're making any profit, and I've been stuck into that before. Where, yeah. You know, just because, wow, it's a million dollar job, you're going to make a million dollars, and all your workers think you're going to make a million dollars, all your subbies think you're going to make a million bucks, and in fact, you make the least that you've ever made because yeah. you, you get complacent. And one of the things, when I actually went bust, I had $14 million of work on my books. Yeah. How can you go bust when you've got $14 million bucks of work? I tell you, I'll, come to me, I'll show you how you do it. Yeah. So I, I was talking with um, some people this morning. And they've got a, a great business, been around for 25 plus years, um, but their margin's only sitting at 15%. Now, and they're running faster on the hamster wheel because they've got two directors, they've got 15 guys, um, and just by us focusing on improving, getting their margin to 20%, they're going to they're gonna make an extra 250 to 300K straight away. That's going to go straight into their back pocket. So... Your numbers and your margin are an absolute must to be able to control that labour. Poorly structured uh, labour contracts is a, a is a massive one, and and I'll let Russ talk a little bit to this in terms of milestone payments, structuring those closer together so that you have good cash flow, getting a bigger deposit up front, uh, and also there's a lot of other strategies that you can do with regards to um, having your clients pay for the carpet, etc. Yeah, so I think uh, Marty said there's a whole different there's a whole lot of different ways of actually because we a lot of us just become the bank and we've done the normal thing. You know, well we might make ten percent on the carpet of the house, and the carpet might cost you yeah you know, ten grand and you make a thousand bucks, but you become the bank for three or four months until that sec the job's finished and you've got to put the deposit down all those sort of things. So you really need to consider kitchens are another one. I don't I never supply a kitchen, so um, my kitchen company gives me a a, a referral fee. You know, most kitchen I get a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars back as a referral fee, but I'm not carrying the load of the twenty or thirty thousand dollar kitchen out of my cash flow because cash flow is so important. But it's more so important now, you know, when things potentially may tighten up. So cash flow is absolutely crucial at the moment. So, um, and like Marty said, with your payment claims, you know, instead of you might have five payment claims on a job, make that ten. You know, negotiate, talk to your people, your subcontractors. You know, if you're paying retentions on job, I hope you're not. But if you are paying retentions, 
take retentions off your subcontractors as well. Exactly. And if there has been delays in the contract, so if there's a delay because of COVID-19 or anything like that for four to six weeks, do you have clauses in there that allow for overhead recovery margin because of extension of contracts? Like who's paying for the jumbo bins? Who's paying for the scaffolding? Who's paying for the contract works ex insurance for all of that extra time? Yeah, so contract works insurance, generally the standard one, I know my one does, will actually have a percentage in there of what you can claim for, for increasing material costs, etc. I was looking at it the other day, um, going through my contracts as well. So just with this COVID-19, you know, so there's, if you, you should have contract works insurance on most jobs, as long as, as with, the, with your limited liability insurance. So actually go into your contracts and see what and the insurance is and actually have a read and spend some time and actually figure out what you're entitled to, what you're not entitled to. It's really important. Yeah. Another one is being able to take, uh, control the job in real time, shorten that feedback loop. So the guys on site have got daily feedback and then the, in the office you've got daily and weekly feedback to know exactly how the job's progressing labour-wise so that you can control that work in progress in real time. If you're not getting your forecast labour and contrasting it with your actual labour, then you're missing a massive opportunity to control the job. Like labour is 80% of the success of how you're going to go during that job. I often get people talk to me about um, the code of compliance, about getting that last payment. And you, my contract says they need to pay me after I've done the final, you know, practical completion, etc. But a lot of clients will go, hey, I can't pay you, the bank won't release the money. So, so although your clause and your contract says that you should get paid, often we don't get paid. So it's, it's about making those last payments minimal. It's about splitting up those last payments to your plumber, your, sp your electrician, your painter, you know, with your own little retentions. Whether the client's got a retention or not, you potentially can have your own retention. Because, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because nine times out of 10, we're the one who's going back doing a full quality check and having to get the painter back, the plumber back and all those bits and pieces. So why not make them feel a little bit of pain, make them accountable. And the other thing is actually, actually, if there is something holding the job up to get your money, freaking get it, get it done. Yeah. You know, don't, don't procrastinate, don't put it on the bottom of the pole, get the job done, get your, it doesn't matter who it is, get your plumber there, get your sparky there, get your builder there to put that last bit of skirting, get it done and get your cash. You know, we put it off too much. 100%. A uh, lack of a, oh, not capturing and processing variations or change orders in real time. So this is a lot more straightforward through um, build a trend, co-construct, rave, etc. project management systems that you can just uh, invoice people straight away through the app. If it, you might set a target or a trigger point. So if a job's a variation is less than 500 bucks, you agree with the owner, hey, we'll just progress through and we'll capture those so we don't slow the job down. But anything else, we'll get it priced up and we'll get it invoiced uh, and we'll get it signed off so that the job can just keep ticking over. And that should happen on a minimum at each week. Uh, if it's not or you're waiting till the end of the job like the old days, then you're just setting yourself up for a lot of pain with your clients and a lot of arguments. What do you do there, Russ? Yeah, same thing with, with, right, with our variations and all that. Um, obviously, it's... It, it, our foreman really scoped at the start of the job what's the variation it's quite clear what's in our contract what's not in our contract our variations we have weekly site biddings each week they're talked about but we're also preempting variations um and also we're trying to up so i've just been at a, a job actually that we're doing and um we've we've re-roofed half the house and we're painting the whole house but the existing part of the house is 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 the old roof and it looks a bit it looks okay but it's average so i've already sent an email to my client going hey i reckon we should paint the chimney repaint existing front of the house if we don't if we don't replace it just paint it and he's, he's already within half an hour going shit can you get us a price sounds great so upsell, awesome. you, upsell yourself on variations yeah and, and see those variations not a, not as a hindrance but as an opportunity for improving the client's job making more money and having a better outcome yeah and it's easy to do if you if the job's going well and they can visually see it you know you go look at that how and, and that's what i talk about that sales skill Coming mm. in, and, and, and I do that reasonably well because I wave my arms about. I'm usually, I'm truly, I'm usually truly, um, yeah, I love the, I love the job. So I actually truly invested in my client to get the best looking job, you know, and and, and, and they feel that passion, and, yeah. and it makes it easier to sell. Now this is a massive one too that we see lack of a strong data system, and quite often this comes from either arguments over milestones and whether that milestone's actually been met so you can have on or about in your terms rather than it actually having to be that milestone 
you can invoice to the percentage of that milestone. We can just get rid of this completely like Russ has with uh, doing weekly invoicing and splitting the job up by week. Now, lack of a strong debtor system, if you feel that, you know, you as the owner struggle with having those tough conversations, then either outsource that to someone else in your team and have a, have a bookkeeper. Like we've got members who, who had every other aspect of that their business sussed. They got in the crap financially because they weren't having those tough conversations with their clients with regards to, and with their team, with regards to hitting those milestones and also with regards to getting people to pay. So you can outsource to outsource data management companies as well. Yeah, I've uh, got a new office lady at the moment. She's only been with me since Christmas time. Um, and cheapers, someone that's really good at that and does it well makes a huge difference. And even by putting a, a thank you, I don't know how to do it on the computer, but a thank you in one of those big yellow happy faces, yeah. Every time I get exactly. Client, hey, thanks, Bronny. Have a have a great day yourself. Yep. Like or see, yeah. Even if you do it the old school way, you send them out on a yellow yellow coloured bit of paper. You put a chocolate Frito frog in there. Your office lady calls up the client, or the client's office lady establishes a good relationship. You get in front of that stuff rather than being behind it. So we got pro, uh, trainings on data management as well. So that's a massive one. Yeah, it seems simple. Uh, yeah, slow invoicing and not having a bookkeeper. So the guys I was talking to this morning, 30 years in business, but a very slow, antiquated invoicing process, which is impacting their um, their cash flow. And they're having to work harder than what they potentially should be because their office lady controls the, basically uses this antiquated um, bookkeeping system instead of zero with project management or a pricing program. So consequently, they're spending way more time to double check and get the invoices out to, and she's manually entering the invoice instead of having it in zero, getting the feed direct from the merchant, and then invoicing the client. So there's lots of things that you can do that might be slowing down your invoice collection and can put you into a cash flow challenge. Another one is being able to diagnose number 16, is the challenge cash flow, so a timing thing? Is it margin? And is it margin going into the job so you've got poor marketing, you're not positioning yourself as the sales surgeon or pricing, you're not putting the right project management fees on, you don't have a suitable overhead recovery margin. So it'll be one of those three key things. Or is it controlling the labor on the way through? Is it material overruns? Is it sub trades and suppliers? Or is it you're not capturing variations? So what are those ones? So it's either going into the job or on the way through. And I would start with on the way through because you've all got jobs on at the moment or you should have. So I would start looking at those key things first and then work backwards to the front, uh, front end. And they're all pretty straightforward stuff to work on. And if you break it down, then you can get 1% in each area to make significant changes. Issues really happen overnight. That's true, getting in trouble is usually through an accrual of lots of small things. And typically this comes from the stories that we tell, that we tell ourselves it's all right because we're marketing or it's all we'll grow into our overheads or John's a new foreman or I don't have the time to look into that or it's too hard to get the forecast labor hours versus the actual hours or I don't have time to do the meeting and drive across to the sites there's always solutions that you guys can do, use and we've seen a lot of those with zoom now being able to have these meetings construction meetings and the labor hours in uh, real time Lack of focus by having multiple businesses or no systems and help uh, and help. I'm guilty of this myself. And I've found that when I've had just one business or I've been focused in one area, it makes a massive difference. So I think this is a big one. Don't get too diversified. Focus on nailing one area first, whether it's your pricing, controlling your labor on site, productivity on site, get that working well. And business is a collection of systems. So if it's in your head, it's not written down, then you can't teach it to someone else. It's going to stay your responsibility and you're going to be on the hook uh, as the person who has the biggest investment, both money, time and emotion wise into your business. So make sure that you do have those systems uh, written down. And yeah, the stories that we tell ourselves, it's okay to do that big job, okay, low margin because it's big, there'll be a great case study, we're just getting started, whatever. Don't get sucked into that, because if anything goes skew with with those jobs, then uh, it's a recipe for disaster. Sorry, Marty, just back on your um, your point about the system side of things, if any of you have long-term goals to sell your business as well, that's where the value is. 
the value you want to build in your company is not in you personally. It's in those systems. You want someone to be able to just simply turn the key, come in and actually take over your businesses with all the systems running smoothly. So to build what we call goodwill in your business, you want those systems in place. So just if your long-term goal is to sell your business, um, you definitely want to build up some good systems as you go along. 100%. So if you go through the TPB uh, membership site, we've got systems for marketing. So you've got a lead machine of the ideal kind of jobs, sales system to position yourself, get your jobs across the line, educate people why they should choose you, pricing systems, make sure you're pricing a job accurately to the right margin, and then systems for running the job, productivity of your team, get culture buy-in, and then systems for the admin and the financial management of the job. Those are the key systems, better systemize the business, the higher the multiple that you'll get. So it means that a new business owner coming in has more confidence that they can replicate that result and they're willing to get a higher price earnings relationship. All right, the mindset. So this is a big one. And a big one is if you is owning the problem. And biggest thing I found is if you have a conversation with yourself in the mirror, true conversation and regarding anything that you want to change, I got myself into this situation and if I got myself into it, then I can take ownership of it and I can get myself out of it. And the, one of the best ways to do that is to take a 30,000 foot overview of yourself, kind of like you're controlling yourself as a player in Fortnite. And then you can see, am I doing the right things each day to get myself out of this situation? So if you draw up a plan, we can draw up a plan today, it's gonna to give you confidence and clarity of what you should be working on. You've then got a plan you can work through and action each point as you go. Talk to your accountant, talk to Liam to make sure that you're doing the right actions, got your numbers accurate, and that plan should have dates and people assigned to it. One of the other things that I found also really good was uh, when I got in the uh, crap was being comfortable with the worst case scenario and then going, well, if I do go bankrupt, it's going to suck and I'll do everything in my power to not go there. But by making, uh, I guess, making peace with that outcome, was, hey, if I do go bankrupt, then I will set up other accounts with other merchants, go into business with my wife, or I'll go and work for my mate, John. And I found that took a whole lot of stress off me, and I was able to move forward and take actions to get out of the crap uh, other than what I would have. Russ, what do you got around the psychology of... Um, mindset when you've got out of there. I guess one of the other things is people have got out of far worse situations than what you might currently be in. So we've had members, when they first come to us, over a million dollars in the hole. Uh, a guy who was head of the master builders got a creditor's compromise. So you can get into a creditor's compromise. So if you think you've got bankruptcy, then you've got liquidation, creditor's compromise. You can go have a creditor's compromise, negotiate with your um, creditors, maybe pay them 30 or 50 cents on the dollar, which is better than you going under and them not getting anything. You can negotiate holiday plans. You can negotiate payment plans. There's lots of things that you can do to get yourself out of this situation if you are having any financial challenges at the moment. People have got out of worse. Lots of our members, as I say, lots of building company owners who are successful have had a challenge at some situation. And if you think, turn the situation around, it's not what's happening to you, it's what's happening for me. So this is happening for me. What's this telling me or teaching me that I need to learn about my business and how I'm running it so that I don't have this challenge going forward. So I make these changes mindset wise and I get out of this for, um, for the future. You got yourself into this situation, you can get yourself out of this situation. Get clarity, get numbers, get your team around you and take massive action and cross stuff off and talk to people. There's hundreds of people in this community and I guarantee you at least 50% of them have gone through a significant financial challenge. And a lot of our members are more than willing to help. So if you are having financial challenges, reach out. I can put you in touch with at least half a dozen to a dozen people who will happily jump on the phone and have a chat with you once you've drawn up your plan and you're taking action. Russ, what would you add mindset-wise, mate? Well, I think exactly that, Marty. I think, see, I'd rather go bankrupt again than get divorced. That was harder than going bankrupt because your family is everything. So I think for me, um, I'm glad I went bankrupt because I'm in a situation now where I'm actually loving my life, have a lovely partner, it's awesome. So going bankrupt, I'm not saying you can't get out of it, but it's not the end of the world. 
it's just something that happens to you. So that's yeah. your, your mindset. I wake up every day at the moment, I wake up every day and have gratitude for where I'm at, what I'm doing. And for the people in New Zealand, the last month being locked down, man, we've gone without a lot of stuff and it actually hasn't been that bad. Yeah. So your business and your money is only one part of your life. But if you, you know, I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying go out there and go bankrupt. <laughs> I'm absolutely not saying that. And it's, um, but, but it's just, yeah, I think it's that mindset and it's surrounding yourself with good people. When I went bankrupt, man, I knew who my friends were. You know, and I, as Marty said, I, I looked in the mirror and I, and I stood up and I, and I, I owned it. And, and I owned it now. I own, I own it now. I, I'm, I share it with people, you know, 10 years later because I want to help people. You know, um, I'm not hiding from the fact that I went bankrupt right, right this moment. Yeah. Um, you, know, you own it. You own it. It's, it's how it is. And it's not, it's, you're not a leper. It's just a part, part of what happened. But That's there's it. absolutely ways out of it, 100%. If I look back now and I go, what a dumbass, Russell. If you'd changed those things, you wouldn't have gone bankrupt. In fact, I deserved to go bankrupt. The way I was running my business and running my life, I freaking deserved it. I got what was coming to me because I, yeah. I, I didn't know my numbers. I had no idea. I didn't control work in progress, all these things. Sure, I did amazing sales and I, did, I worked on my genius and did one part of my business, but not the rest. So I absolutely deserved it, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's a big thing there, Russ, is identifying what you have parts of your business that are going well, and it might only be one or two areas of your business that we really need to focus on the next 90 days that are going to make a significant difference once we fix those. So, if you are in a cash challenge, first key point determine your exact financial position and figure out what's all the money that you owe. And what's all the money that you have coming in, uh, Liam? Yep. So yeah, assets and liabilities or a balance sheet. What should people do, and how they go about doing this? Yeah, I mean, what you want to list here. So, as Marty said, assets are what you own. Liabilities, are what you owe. So, you want to start with the simple things. What are your bank account balances in funds? Your their assets. If you owe the bank money, their liabilities. So, you want to start listing down. Firstly, assets, what you own bank accounts, any property, plants and equipment, so your vehicles and the likes, any of your tools in there. Um, another big asset like we've been talking about is that receivables balance. Um, so you wanna be really taking a good look at that and see are they all recoverable first and foremost because you want it to be a position based on what you can recover um, over the next little while. Um, and likewise, your liabilities, you wanna be including your creditors. So what do you owe to your suppliers? What do you owe to your employees as well? So thinking about things like holiday pay, um, make sure you're including that in there because that is something you will have to pay out to them um, if a staff member left or if you went belly up, you'd have to pay that out. So just taking a good look at- Unless they're a contractor. Unless they're a contractor. So that is one of the risks that contractors take and that's why they generally get paid a higher amount. Um, but yeah, if you are using contractors, there won't be any obligations there to pay them anything. But a lot of people forget to actually book that holiday pay on their balance sheet. When I'm talking about the year end financials, it is something that you will owe if you do have employees. So make sure you're factoring that in as well. So just a, just a snapshot of what, um, what you own versus what you owe there. Cool. And you can break this down over 30 days into what money have you got coming in? and what money's going out and when. And a massive thing here is to work out the timings so that you get some good clarity around what does your bank balance look like as you go through this situation. If you have a look down the bottom, if you do this in zero, it's gonna give you a graph so that you can see when you dip into the red. You can then see, hey, do I need to over extend my overdraft? Do I need to get some credit cards? What do I need? Do I need to structure some deposits closer together? What do I need to do to make sure that I can cover off that shortfall? So what we're talking about here, you can go through, work through this in the workbook to work out who are all your debtors uh, and who are all your creditors. So what money's coming in, what money's going out, add that up total, put the dates by it, and that's gonna help give you some good insight into where you actually at. Now, one of the things that we haven't covered or we didn't cover last, last week was your monthly personal position. So what does your personal position look like? Are you actually paying yourself a salary and is it enough to cover your personal outgoings each month? So I would recommend doing a personal budget and having a look at what can you trim personal-wise that's gonna make a big difference. 
So maybe you're eating out more than, <laughs> probably not at the moment. Maybe you're eating out more than you could or should be. What can you trim off those uh, monthly outgoings? Yeah, I know I can trim the Sky Sport. I just thought about that then, Marty. I haven't watched live sport for two months. Why am I paying the bill? Yeah, exactly. 100%, right? Now, key things that you want to be having a look at, we've got trainings on each of these. Your contract, how that's structured. A lot of key tips that we've previously discussed on uh, overhead recovery margin, what happens if the job gets pushed out. Uh, some of our members even charge 20 to 25% if they sign the contract, but the job doesn't go ahead. You can recover money from the client. Basically, you can put into your contract whatever the other party is willing to sign. And if you have a master builder's contract or any of the other core ones, then you can add in addendums, extra clauses uh, for your particular contract. Any key ones that you add in, Russ? Not, not, not the most of the standard contracts cover that, you know, and with my contract works and all that. Um, but yeah, that is a, it is hard to, it's, it's actually hard for a client to get out of a contract. Mm. You know, once it's signed in, there's actually, there's clauses in there. They can't just give you the muck around. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I haven't had that situation, but I know of other builders that have had that situation of every claim money, just for all the efforts and the things they put in at the start. But yeah, that's definitely, it's in my contract. Definitely need to be putting that in there. What if they, what if they have to get out for whatever reason? Even even simple things like admin fee for variation. So if they don't proceed with a variation, you might charge them two hundred and fifty to five hundred bucks admin fee for any variation that they don't proceed with because you're having to go and price things up at the merchant. You're having to talk to sub trades and you're putting a lot of pricing time into it. So you make them aware of that and you say, hey, we're happy to go ahead with any of the any variation. We'd love to do it but just know that we're putting quite a bit of time into going and sourcing this, pricing things up, talking to people, and if you don't go ahead with it, then we need to account for our time. Yeah, uh, late payment of your invoices, have a, they have a, there's, a, there's a penalty clause in all my contracts for a, a late payment of, on, a, on, a, on an invoice as well. So they mm -hmm. get charged interest, because more cool. than mine, are not your neighbor draft. <laughs> yeah, 100%, right? It's costing you money. So tighten up all these different areas, it'll make a massive difference. Yep. Now, once you get your plan together, you need the structure of how you're actually going to get out of this. Because quite often, people don't have business problems, they have personal problems that transfer over into their business. And there's two types of pain. You can either have the pain of discipline, of having a structure, of learning this stuff, working on your business, getting out of the crap, or you can have the pain of regret. Of, get, of not making those tough decisions, not having your numbers visible, and not learning the stuff to make those improvements. So it's really important, particularly during these times, that you have a daily structure. So there's my, my personal daily program on the right. When I'm working on the business, exercise, etc. think of yourself as a business athlete. What's the fuel that you're putting in your machine to keep it burning? And then what's the structure for your week? So when are you actually working on your action plan to get out of this financial hole? Okay, again, we have this, and what are you putting in your mind? What are you listening to? What are you reading each week to get out of there? So we've got a recommended reading list on the membership site. Uh, do you have your vision book at hand? Are you looking at it each day, giving you the feel on uh, the strategies that you need to be implementing? So I would say create your default diary on when you are going to actually action this plan. And you should be able to action a plan to get out of this within 90 days. Uh, maybe 30 days for the fast action strategies that you need to implement and at least five hours per week. And if you do it first thing in the morning when you're freshest, it's going to set you up. You've done the right things. You've eaten that frog, as Brian Tracy would say, and you're progressing towards your goals. Next key thing, we're going to schedule, look at when are the payments coming in and out. Get your uh, debtors and creditors list with timings. Right, and then big one, overhead reduction exercise. So if you, I'll let Liam actually work through this, what the easiest way, because you, you would have done this with quite a few people, easiest way for people to go through and have a look at their overheads and which ones are typically the quickest and best to cut. Yep, so I mean, as the instructions on screen there say, what you want to do is go to your accounting system. Um, so given we're just coming to the end of April, I would be looking at probably running a profit and loss report from April last year through to March 2020. So that happens to coincide with a New Zealand financial year, but um, at least it'll give you 12 months worth of data there. 
what you're going to start focusing on is your overhead. So a bit like Marty was talking about with your personal budget, you're simply trying to replicate that with your business. You're looking at any kind of expenditure you can start trimming. So were you having a bit of entertainment in there, whether it was more personal rather than business related, um, or whether it was entertaining potential clients that wasn't really amount, amounting to anything? So could you look to start trimming that? Start looking at your motor vehicle expenses. Um, are there ways that you can trim that? Insurances, have you actually shopped around for a while and seen what else is out there with other insurance brokers just to make sure you are getting a good deal there? Um, and then you start looking at, okay, what's your, probably a massive wage cost that could be sitting in there is maybe some admin staff there. Um, are you getting value for money there or could you start looking at replacing that with an outsource model with a bookkeeper with some accounting systems in place, for example? So just really looking at what are those big ticket items that are probably consuming 60 to 80% of the entire overhead amount and can you start trimming the fat there? So just replicate what you're doing with that personal budget but from a business point of view because like I mentioned before, when we're talking about valuing businesses, it's always done on a multiple of earnings. So basically any dollar you can save is going to probably equate to three or four dollars extra in terms of the value of your business. So it is an exercise you should be doing quite regular, just making sure you are trimming the fat there. So if any of those expenses aren't really going into turning into turning into any sales dollars, can you get rid of them altogether? It's interesting yeah. you say that, Liam. I uh, made a I made a few uh, inquiries over when I was locked, locked down about um, outsourced pay, get yeah, people doing my pay. Yep. Um, yep. Um, wages, and it's cheap. It's bloody cheap as. Oh, it is cheap. They're my office lady downstairs at the moment. Yep, exactly. And I mean, I don't like to be cruel like that, but um, if well, you do yeah. have accounting admin staff in this day and age, that is a pretty easy... Um, <laughs> pretty easy cost to um, get rid of by simply either outsourcing to say a bookkeeper um, a lot of the payroll solutions say add-ons that work with zero you can pretty much outsource all of the payroll filing um, they'll even say for example take out the taxes amount every time you do a pay run and then they'll pay it to the ird on your behalf um, and a lot of the costs for those payroll add-ons aren't that expensive. So I would start looking at, say, yeah, that, that's a prime example. If you do have any admin accounting staff, payroll staff, um, even debtor management staff like we've talked about, um, there are solutions out there and which will be far cheaper than actually hiring someone in-house. Yeah, you, like you get rid of the headaches of having to make someone redundant in times like these. You just simply turn the tap off um, if you're outsourcing. Um, so it can you can look at virtual money. assistants, VAs. Like we have yep. six VAs in the Philippines. So for the space of paying someone 60 grand, we can pay someone 12 grand. Yep, exactly. To do exactly the same role. Yep. So any kind of admin role, there is great opportunities this day and age to actually be able to replicate that with outsourcing. Um, so definitely look into it. I'm happy to point you in the direction of payroll providers and the likes um, if you want to get in touch. But that could be quite a large chunk of your overhead costs. So um, I would start looking at um, ways you could potentially... Go through and rank your team 1 to 10, you know, 1 to 5, who... who Hired everyone. Who else would you? Who would you rehire again? Yep. Another big one is also you should only really invest in uh, mindset and growth activities that are going to help you go forwards. And think about not just the cost, but what is the opportunity cost if I do not get this business, this part of my business right? So what difference would it make if I got my sales process right and my sales skills right? Maybe you need sales training. Maybe you're marketing, you're only getting five leads a month of your ideal. How much difference would it make if you were to get 10 to 15 leads a month and convert a third of those into jobs? Could be an absolute game changer. Yep. So think about the value that you're going to get from something and is it the top 20% that's going to make a big difference? So Sean's got a question. What are people doing for bookkeepers? I'd like to hear what others do in-house or VA. So we have a external bookkeeper. She charges us like 250 bucks a month. Um, yeah, for hours, uh, we're considering getting a, uh, a virtual assistant to do it. Uh, Russ, what, what about you guys? Yeah, so I have a I have an office lady at the moment, admin office lady that does three days a week. I've sort of been questioning how many days she should do. Mm. And. Um, but yeah, like I say, I just looked at one of those payroll schemes, and it's, it's only like about four dollars a person yep. a week to do to do all the pay. It's like yeah, I'm going to do it for I'm going to do it for sixty bucks a week. 
you know, so it's a no-brainer, really. I've just got the email yesterday, so I'm going to be looking into that. Yeah, and a massive thing is to get clarity on your numbers and then be able to make objective numbers, decisions numbers-based as opposed to emotional ones. Well, Mary's been with me for five years, et cetera, et cetera. So yep. why are you getting the value from Mary? And what helped get you to this level might not be the, one, the right systems, people, and processes to help get you to where you want to go. Mm. And in terms of your bookkeeping, it just depends as well how much of that function you're already doing. So you may have the guys or you may have a staff member that's already raising the sales invoices anyway through your, your job costing add-on. So it's then what's left. It's simply just reconciling bank transactions where you can automate a lot of that through zero anyway. So you, if you are going to outsource to a bookkeeper, their hours are probably going to be relatively minimal. So the cost to you is going to be quite cheap rather than having a full-time or three days a week staff member there. So just actually trying to list what are the duties they're currently performing um, because you you might find that even you have time at the end of If you've got a good accountant in there that's setting up bank rules and coding rules for you, you might have your own time yourself simply to check in for 10 minutes and just code away some of those bank tra transactions depending on the size of your business. Um, so actually try and look at breaking down the duties they're currently performing and then we can have a look at whether you can outsource some of those. Next thing is uh, look at A, budgeting for profit. So what will it mean to increase your margin? Even if you can just go from what I was talking with uh, these members this morning, if you can go from 15 to 20%, that could be a game changer for you. Uh, the difference between you know doubling your profit or going from break even to making significantly good profit. So typically that margin is going to come down to those three key areas going into so marketing. So you've got a steady flow of the right kind of jobs, sales positioning yourself as the go-to. So an info pack, a well pack, quote into action plan, good scripts, et cetera. And then pricing to make sure you've got everything in there for P&G, project management fee, overhead recovery margin, et cetera. And then control that job on the way through the labor in real time, materials, negotiate with your sub trades. Russ, you're doing something there regarding negotiating with your sub trades regarding all the marketing that you're investing in now? Yeah, so I've just stepped up my marketing a little bit because I had time to actually work on it a little bit in the lockdown. Um, so yeah, I've been, in, I've been in discussion with my trades because yeah, my plumber, my electrician, my main ones, my um, painter, etc. they're going to ben benefit hugely by me doing more work. But I'm paying for all the marketing and doing all the meetings and that. So I've hit them all up. So we're going to have a catch up very shortly about them investing in some of my marketing because it's beneficial for them and why should I be doing all this marketing? Um, with them, they benefit if they're just going to give me the same margins, the same, you know. So we've had the, the, the brief discussion at this stage and after we go into level two in New Zealand, we'll, we'll be catching up with the, all of them and actually um, having a discussion and putting my thoughts to them. 100%. And you can also, like some of our members will get people to their plumber, sparky, scaffolding company, merchant, et cetera, to pay like 500 bucks each to contribute to their workbook which is also a good one to do. I mean, their information pack. So basically they pay for the printing of it. Now, if you haven't already, you need to have a look at what are the numbers that are driving this. So fill in your KPIs on the TPB Wealth Dashboard. So coming in two weeks time, we're gonna start filling in our numbers every month. This is gonna allow you to, we're actually creating an app and a SaaS program for this. You know, fill in your numbers, we're going to be able to rank you and you'll see exactly how you're going each month and how you're going each month versus other members. So you'll be able to see how you're going number of leads, average dollar sale, professional builders rate, et cetera, et cetera. So this is going to be a great tool to allow you to hone in exactly where you are. So we're going to color code this as well, like a, a uh, traffic light. So red, if you've got a margin, Below 12%, for example, that'll be in the red. Uh, tension, danger, do not proceed, do not pass go, fix this straight away. 12 to 18% in orange, great, needs a bit of attention. And then 18% above, it's green, fine. So this is gonna allow us to dial in and give you guys the exact strategies that are gonna make the most difference. So if you haven't already, fill those numbers in uh, and then that'll set you up for the next month's KPI webinar. And each month you'll be able to see what progress you're making. The CC each job. Now, Russ, we talked about this uh, with members a couple of weeks ago in Australia. Russ, can you walk through uh, just we what we went through uh, last week, what's important with structuring jobs and payments? Yep. So um, yeah, we we're talking to some, some friends of ours in Aussie that are having uh, some issues on a few jobs. So 
the key thing was actually getting all, I think they had 14 jobs on. So the key thing was we needed cash right now. So getting all those jobs, printing all the jobs out, putting them on the wall of the office and actually labeling them, you know, red, uh, green or orange or amber. So it was about figuring out at what stage they were with the jobs, what stages, you know, the work in progress. If you're not doing any work in progress, do your work in progress and all those jobs, figure out what jobs could be finished. Um, I suppose the easiest with, they were, they were struggling to, um, get, to get, get cash flow and get subbies and things to come to their jobs. So it was a key thing of working out what job, you know, what's required on each job. So how many subbies, what, what outlay for yourself before you got the money in basically. So what jobs need more labor, more painting, plumbers, electricians, etc. that you could do. So, um, and, and picking on those jobs are going to give you the most cash flow easy. So it might be, you might be loading a job up with a few guys just for three or four days, bang, to get your code of compliance and to get your money if you needed cash. So just it was all about just bringing cash into your business and getting those jobs finished. Rather than a job last for another three or four or five weeks you got your money, how do you just nail a job and get it done? So looking at every single job on its merit of where it was, um, you know, what, what, what did you have to pay? I've got to pay 10 grand to the plumber until he comes back and does the second stage. Well, let's just put that aside. What can we do to get cash in? So it's really just about getting cash on your jobs. And, and, and it's more work in progress, really, to see what jobs can be done to get your cash flow going. Because cash flow is key at the moment. Um, and if you're going down that slippery slope, you need to stop it. And the only way to stop it is get cash in your business. And it was just really evaluating all your jobs, really. Um, and, and, and getting in amongst your jobs, talking to your clients. They were they were talking to me about, oh no, the clients can't pay because of this, this and this. And like I said, well, have you actually been been with your clients? Actually, have you sat with your clients, had the discussion? Because I'll tell you right now, a client doesn't want you to fall over or, or be stuck because if their job's halfway through, it's gonna be a long haul for them as well. So most clients, if you go and see them face to face, if you've got an issue, will actually, they don't wanna be in financial difficulty themselves or leave themselves exposed, but they certainly they could help. So they, your 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 two weekly or monthly progress payment, maybe they could break that down to a payment each week, or they could pay the deposit on the kitchen or something like that. So it's just you know, getting out there and doing whatever you can if you are going down that slope to, to talk and communicate with your client. You know, because we're not not everyone's a bad person, and your contract might say one thing, but there's no reason why you shouldn't get in front of your clients and actually that. But it's re it's really figuring out what job you can finish. Um, I suppose in the least time, with what what job of all those jobs is going to give you the greatest impact on your cash flow and, and your business right here yep. and now? If you're in um, if you're in cash flow worries, yeah. And do you have the right guys assigned to the right job to finish it? Yeah. So yeah, the whole the whole yeah every job just, just just print them out, put them up on your boards, and just label them orange, orange, green, and red, and just do the old traffic light. And you should be doing that. I do that myself now for labour on jobs because I'm quite visual. So I, if I've got a big red stamp on my job, I know that I'm in the shell, I've got to talk about it. Yeah, for sure. So when you, when you have identified who are your creditors, who do you owe money to, next key thing is going to talk to them and ideally you want to talk to them face to face. First, if that's not possible, a Zoom meeting, phone call, etc. And so what you want to do is you want to make a list of all the people and rank them. Now, you're going to be able to potentially have payment plans with certain creditors. Uh, other people, you might be able to get a payment holiday. So we've put together a script. Uh, a lot of our members have used this. So the basics are people want to know that you've identified why you got in the crap. If you're up front with people, they're far more likely to work with you. So, hey, I've got into some financial strife. Here's why. We had some labor overruns on this job. I've had this challenge with this. We underestimated this. Here's what happened. My plan to get out of this situation, so I'm talking about with your sub trades, your merchant, etc. My plan to get out of this over the next 90 days is A, B, C. So I'm, I'm going to land, I've got three more jobs in the pipeline. I'm increasing my margin. I'm structuring my uh, milestones closer together so I don't get into this financial strife. I'm a I've am got my team dialed in more with regards to their labor hours. So you wanna give them confidence that you have a plan to get out of it. And I've also got these six jobs booked in forward with $1.5 million worth of work going forward. And it's all yours, Mr. Sparky, Mr. Subtrade, Placemakers, Mr. Merchant. Uh, and obviously, I would like your help to get through this time. And it might be that you're reminding them, hey, over the last three years, 
I've spent one and a half million dollars with you, Mr. Merchant. Well, hey, Mr. Plumber, I've given you 370K over the last three years worth of work. So a big thing, get your, get your team around because these people are important at this time. Next, I need. So how do you think you'll be able to help out? What can you do to help me? And if they're still not forthcoming, say, hey, would you be able to do a 90-day payment holiday? Or I can pay you 33% now and I can pay you the other amount going forwards once I just got out of this tight cash flow hole because they won't want you to fall over. They will want ongoing work. They'll want their money, et cetera. And getting some money rather than none is far more um, palatable to them. What else would you add to this, Russ, from your experience of negotiating with people? Yeah, well, um, well, I did fall over, so, um, <laughs> but I still went and saw every single of my subbies and every single one of my suppliers. And and like I say, I think this sort of situation here that we've got on the on the, on the screen here, you really need to go and do it face to face. It's it's way way more impact if you can. Um, my suppliers, one particular window company, I owed forty eight thousand dollars to, which was retail. It was probably thirty five to them possibly, but they weren't so much worried about the money. I'd give them $400,000 of windows that year. They were more worried about the future. So hence to say they still do my windows now. My electrician, my plumber, and my guy that does my sign writing, every person, I think I only had two shitty phone calls to be honest with you, but yeah. it's just getting in front of them, exactly what you're saying here, what we got doing for, they just want to know what looks like, because we're all good people. They've, they've, most of these suppliers we've, we're, we have a, a relationship with, you know, um, because we've been using it for a number, a number of years and they want to see you survive. They want to do work yourself. So have the conversation. It's actually, and once you start having those conversations with your suppliers and with your subcontractors, it becomes easier and easier and easier. But just get out there and do it. Don't be shy. It's not going to happen by itself. And what's the worst thing they can say? Uh, no. Understand. Yeah. Yeah. Now, a different different strategy, you can consider taking on some investment in the form of a loan that potentially converts to equity, or you have to pay it back. You can look at uh, going to the bank. Um, what would you what would you term around that, Liam, with regards to consider whether to take a loan that potentially converts to equity um, in these times? Yeah, I mean, with that, you just need to be mindful that if you're going to have a loan that converts to equity, you are giving away some of your business. Um, so you then want to make sure that the the value stacks up. I'm not sure if any of you have watched Dragon's Den or the likes on TV, but it's it's similar. They're going to come at you with what they perceive that loan is in terms of value of your business, whether it be 20%, 30%. And they're going to know that you're a bit hamstrung at that point. So they're probably going to want to push it a bit further to take more of your business at a low at a low rate. Um, so I would say avoid it if you can. You, you, there might be a position where you simply can't avoid it just to keep the business going. Um, and just with your bank creditors in the, as well, you just want to be mindful where possible not to start giving away personal guarantees if you can. I realise a lot of banks won't lend if you're in that kind of state without them. Um, but just be mindful if you are giving away personal guarantees of what that opens you up to. Um, but yeah, ju just... Yeah, with that converting to equity, just bear in mind they're going to know you're in a, you're in a bit of financial trouble, so they will probably try and take more of your business at a at a low price, probably a lot less than what it's actually worth. Um, but in some cases, if that means your business can keep trading, then so and you can it. structure some ratchet clauses out the other side that hey, if we hit this revenue, this margin, etc., six months, nine months, twelve months, etc., that equity comes back to you because they're getting an overall greater return because your business is performing better. Correct. So, so keep those kinds of things in mind, or you get a say an extra share, you get a bonus payment provided you hit certain KPIs. So, so yeah, keep that in mind. If you are giving it away at a discount, look for a way in the future when things do turn around that you can recoup some of that, um, because at the end of the day, it's probably a business that you've spent years trying to build up that goodwill in it. Yeah. It's just maybe a couple of bad customers haven't paid you that's put you in this strife. So, you don't want to be giving away something for nothing that you've built built up over the years. So yeah, definitely look to clauses like that to help try and recoup some of that. Uh, and don't, be, don't be scared to, you, know, you mentioned before, Marty, your dad gave you a loan for a bit and, and, and I've done the same. So don't be scared to ask, you know, mm. I'm in a situation now, my partner's just sold a house. So he has a, she has a shitload of money in the bank. Yep. Um, she'll get a couple of percent interest in the bank. But I've got a commercial loan in my factory, which is 9%. So mm. she's going to loan me some money, which is going to get way more um, return 
for yep. her than in the bank, and I'm going to reduce my interest on my 9% commercial loan here. So I'm, yeah. I'm in a real good win. She's in a great win. So have those conversations, you know? Yeah, exactly. So I, th so I think, yeah, structure it like that as a loan, if you can, first and foremost. Yeah. But if they keep pushing for actual equity in the business, yeah. um, then just keep that in mind. You want They'll probably be after quite a big discount. So keep to a loan where you can, because like you said, 2% is ah. barely anything, not worth having your money in the bank. Um, so people will be on the lookout for opportunities like that. Absolutely. Now, liquidity is a big thing. Having cash flow and uh, is basically the blood of your business. Like having oxygen, your business needs it to survive. So if you need to free up some liquidity, you might be able to get some money either from the bank, going applying to the bank, asking friends. So when, when I got in the crap, I went and asked 10 friends. My mum actually said, no, get stuffed. She had plenty of cash. My old man who was on the bones of his ass mortgaged his house. Gave me 50 grand that allowed me to to keep trading with my cleaning company. Uh, credit cards, what can you do there? Investors, you know, whether it's a loan, equity, etc. What can you do to get payment plans? Uh, can you mortgage your house? Refinance assets. So refinance or sell assets. Payment plans with the IRD, with suppliers, etc. Can you get your overdraft extension extended? Like I was quite amazed and quite fortunate. The ANZ, ANZ extended... Uh, our overdraft for our cleaning company uh, and it didn't deserve it, but I just went and had those conversations. I'd had a good relationship with the uh, bank manager, which was crucial. One thing I will say though, if you do not fix these problems head on, get a plan, get your numbers, have someone to hold you accountable, then you will be throwing good money after bad and you will get deeper in the shit until you are forced to Instead of a voluntary liquidation, you might be forced into liquidation or you get a stat demand or you end up going into bankruptcy. So mm -hmm. if you do not make these changes, identify the problem and put in place an action plan, then you're kidding yourself and you're going to get deeper into the shit, which is what I did with my cleaning company. And ironically, the Asian dude, Chinese guy who came and bought my company, sat three of the salespeople, got rid of all the cars, changed the business model to a contractor model, where it's a 60-40 split, so 60% revenue to the cleaners, 40% to the company. So you could look at changing your business model, like some of our members have, to have contracted labor gangs who give you a fixed contract price, and then you are guaranteed your margin, and that's yeah. their problem of controlling the labor. What, what would you say, Russ, on some of those aspects? Yeah, Marty, I've, all, all of those things. But the key thing for me is like, you know, you look at your assets and all that. Um, I, sold, I, I sold my boat, you know, 150,000, 140 grand boat, right, to get some cash in there. And I brought a kayak and I paddled my kayak around. Three years later, I bought my same boat back. So if anyone wants to buy a kayak, they're most welcome. Liam talked about last week, hey, you got your ranger. If you pay, I've got a, probably, I don't know what a ranger is, I don't want to pay for it, 40 grand, 50 grand. If I need some cash, I'm going to sell my Ranger. I'm going to buy myself a van and, and, and run around an old van for three months or four months or six months if I need to, to get my business up and going, and then I'll buy another Ranger. So don't get stuck to all these. Be, don't be looking, get stuck or look flash if you can't afford it. Get back on the bus, sell some of those assets if you need them, get the cash back into your business and do some of the things here at TPB that we're talking about doing, about growing your business and doing it right. And you'll be, you'll look back in a year's time or two years' time and go, wow, that was the best thing I ever did. And you're going to buy a bigger flasher boat, a bigger flasher ranger, you know? And I, think, and I didn't do it. I did it too late. I should have done it, but I didn't do it. But right now, if I have to let go of everything I own, it's, it's gone. Simple as that. I'll get it back later. Yep. Yep. Right. Big one. Shorten the invoicing time. Shorten the feedback loop regarding how the job's progressing labor hours, controlling your work in progress, execute those project management and contract tips. And then lastly, the outcome that we want to get out of this is an actual action plan broken down to what will you do immediately, what will you do in the next 30 days, and then lastly, what will you do 90 days going forward so that you don't have these problems recur and keep coming back. So we've got a couple of samples here for you. They're also in the workbook of a couple of members and what they've done to get out of the, um, out of the hole. 
And the key things to notice about this are it's broken down by timeline wise, immediately, next 30 days, next 90 days. And then it's also broken down by productivity, cash flow, uh, what you can do to get quick cash and what you're doing to talk to your creditors. So there's some tips and strategies here that you can marry up with um, in the workbook and also go through and identify what strategies are going to make the most difference to your business. So we've got a template for you in the workbook to have a crack at. And one of the biggest things I think is to try and just remove as much emotion as possible. Get into action. When the wheels are in motion, you're gonna feel good that you're taking action and you're crossing stuff off your checklist. And by having a date beside it, you've now got a date. Pin this up on your wall so it's visible and then take massive action to get into this stuff. So there's a plan here for you to fill in immediately, next 30 days, next 90 days. There's also some tips what you can do, obviously, once you get out of this, to sell and market your way out of this and try and get as big a deposit upfront as possible You don't, if, or shorten the milestones, get those payments closer together, put many milestones in place. And some of the key ones that are going to help you get out of this quickly are Facebook geofencing ads that Cam went through a few weeks ago and the 1% referral system to help land jobs quicker. So if your cash flow is low, here's some key strategies that you can uh, look at. Do a cash flow forecast, what we went through, have a look at the training that we went through with Liam last week. Massive one, know and show your numbers. Uh, if you're not, make sure you are using fixed price contracts, you get a higher margin. Relate your payment schedule to milestones, put in mini milestones, get larger deposits up front, front load those payments, and a big one, streamline the invoicing system, stuff that we talk about all the time uh, and on time. So all you have to do is go through, tick which ones make the most sense. Don't try and do them all at once. Timeline when you're going to do them. Get your team around. Get your, your management team, your people involved in the office, and your uh, team of advisors, including us, to help you implement these strategies into there. If you've got low gross margin going in, have a look at what's impacting that on your marketing, sales, and pricing. Are you setting your minimum desired gross margin? What can you do to improve that margin on the way through the job? All right, so if anyone's got any questions, type them into the box. Otherwise, these are your action plans. Complete the 19 reasons why people get into crap. It's at the, uh, the end of the workbook. Uh, it's also on the slides, looks like this. Go through, identify which one of these, you know, um, I guess identify, you identify with the most or they staring you right back in the face. Go through, get your exact position of where you're at business wise. Do your personal budget. Assess which jobs uh, you're going to get money out of quickly to get over the line. Do your cash flow forecast. Have a look at the training last week from Liam. Get that in place. Get clarity on your numbers and then make that list of creditors to go and talk to. Put in place your plan. Get your plan up with dates. Send it through to the team. Uh, send it through. Russ and I will both have a look at these. We're happy to work with people one-on-one -on -one if you are in a challenging financial situation to get you out of this. Um, and together, I guess the biggest thing is if you got into this, you can get out of this and with the right strategies, the right mindset, taking action, you can massively get out of this and turn your business around in the next 90 days. All right. I think one of the things I've been doing, Marty, I've been asking myself the question, so, yeah, will this improve, you know, every time I, everything I'm doing, is this good for my business? Will this improve my future? I'm making myself accountable all the time. I was on the shore today and I thought, oh, I'll just go to my local cafe, see if it's open and it's miles out of the way. And I'm like, oh, it wasn't local, so I was miles away. Ask the question, is that valuable to my business? No, it's not. Bang, keep driving. And I've just, just the little shitty things I do during the day and waste so much time, <laughs> I'm keep, keeping it focused. Another really good thing I did the other day, I, I put an email out to my team saying, whoever comes up with a good idea that I implement in my business going forward the next two months, I'll pay one hundred dollars cash for every idea. So I've had all these I've had all these brilliant awesome. ideas. All these yeah. A good one is to do that in your toolbox meeting and theme your toolbox meeting. So every Monday morning, this week it's on productivity. Everyone come with their three best ideas on productivity. Next week it's on health and safety, three best ideas. Whichever one gets implemented, we give fifty or a hundred bucks. 
Oh, it was it was really good by young woman apprentice um sophie says oh have you heard it they've seen the app slack i know at tpb we use slack if you got that we can do this this and this and it was for, for management i was like wait <laughs> and um but it was just because and, and i never even heard of it before but you know but there's people out there in your business that will have some really good ideas if given the opportunity to to bring them forward so yeah absolutely all right thank you very much for your input Liam, appreciate you. If anyone needs to get a hold of Liam, you can contact him at BDO on the North Shore. Yep, just, just look up my LinkedIn if you want. So just Liam Walker, or my email address is liam.walker at bdo.co.nz. Fire me an email, happy to hear from you. Set up a Zoom meeting or have a chat over the phone. Awesome. Once again, thanks very much, Russ. And thank you, team. Together, we've got this, put a plan together, put it into play. We're happy to help and uh, let's crush it over the next 90 days. Cheers guys. Cheers guys.